So I wanted to thank you all for being here today. Um, my name is Evan George, and I'm here with the Massachusetts Office on Disability. And what I do is I travel around to every city and town in Massachusetts, and I put on trainings just like this. For some Massachusetts trivia, does anyone know how many cities and towns are actually in Massachusetts? 351. 351. And I'm sure you would have known as well. There's always one person know. in the you audience. Call that knows me. Oh, um, so do a brief intro. I think it's really yeah. So I travel around to all 351 trainings, um, cities and towns that I can, putting on about one or two trainings a week to try to make sure that all of our citizens are prepared if there's ever an emergency, man-made, or natural disaster. But uh, before I get started and explain more about the training we're going to be doing today, I just wanted to introduce you to your state rep, who was kind enough to reach out to me to organize this training. I'm sure you have some words for that. Uh, no, I was going to say, I just wanted to say thanks for everyone coming. Uh, those who don't know me, I'm Sean Dooley, um, and I'm your state rep, and I live here in Norfolk. Uh, so happy to pr help provide this. Anything we could ever do from a state standpoint, uh, whether it's bringing, you know, coming down and doing seminars like this, or any other training, or if, if there's ever anything that you need from the state, and or even from the federal government that you're having problems with, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I mean, we have a lot of contacts, we have a lot of you know, different people in our office that can help push things along. So that's, you know, that's one of the things that I'm able to do. Um, and, you know, and after this uh, seminar, if you have additional questions, or if you need anything else, please reach out to me. Um, and we can all we can all coordinate. Uh, Betsy Fijol from the uh, Board of Health is here as well. So uh, if anyone has ever has any questions, or if there's ever anything I can do to help you, um, please don't hesitate to reach out. So thank you, sir. I'll stay over here with the puzzle. <laughs> So I loosely said at the beginning that I'm actually from the Department of Homeland Security. And how this all came about is from um, Hurricane uh, Katrina down in New Orleans in 2005. So in 2005, Hurricane Katrina completely devastated the city of New Orleans, resulting in about 1,800 deaths. The entire country then did a review of that incident and found that half of those deaths, roughly 900 people, came from two different groups. One was senior citizens, and the other were people with disabilities, what we call people who require additional assistance. And at first, it kind of shocked everyone because they weren't sure why was the death count for these two groups so high. So what they did was they looked at the local emergency plan for New Orleans. What they found was that really at no level were they planned for the unique needs that senior citizens have. For example, if you send out a communication alert that there's an evacuation, but someone's deaf or hard of hearing, how will that individual actually know they need to evacuate? If somebody has um, mobility assistance, maybe they use a wheelchair, if, how will they actually be able to get from their home to the shelter? None of this was really thought through, and it resulted in a lot of unnecessary death. The second part is on individual preparedness. What the country learned after Katrina was that at the individual level, it doesn't matter how old you are, young you are, how many college degrees you have, or if you've never set foot in a classroom, no one's really prepared for all of a sudden receiving an alert that says you have to shelter in place, you cannot go outside, or you have to evacuate immediately. So this training is really in two parts. The first part is I'm gonna talk you through some bigger plans in terms of your local emergency plan. What can you expect in terms of communication? What can you expect in terms of sheltering? What are some services the state has for senior citizens and people with uh, disabilities? And then the second part will be about your individual preparedness. What materials you need, you need to have on hand? And secondly, what materials should you have in an evacuation go kit, which fortunately you'll all be able to receive as part of this training. So uh, before I go into all of that, though, do we have any other uh, public officials, local emergency managers, people from the city who just want to quickly introduce themselves? Mm -hmm. Way in the back. Hi, I'm Betsy Fitchell. I'm the administrator for the Norfolk Board of Health Office. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. And um, actually, before I go into the training itself also, who here is familiar with the Massachusetts Office on Disability? Generally, about only one person has ever heard of it. So this is an agency. It started in the early 1980s, and it's their job to ensure the full and equal participation of people with disabilities in everyday life. And now, what it means to have a disability varies depending on where you are. And what I mean by that is the federal government, they have their own definition. If you were in Wisconsin, they would have their own definition. But here in Massachusetts, all it really uh, means is that you're somebody who might need additional assistance. 
So if you ever have any questions, such as why is a wheelchair ramp at a certain level? Why doesn't a certain facility have enough handicapped parking? Why does my apartment building not have a wide enough door? All of those types of questions that might fall under the ADA, you would contact this office and they'll have people there to tell you what your rights are and what either the public or private entity needs to do. And that communication is there for you. So getting into it, everyone should have a packet. I know some people are going to trickle in, and that's more than fine. Does anyone need a uh, quick handout before we start? All right, look at that, perfect. So I always get a kick, because whenever I pass these out to people, the first thing people do is they start to spin it. I promise I'm going to explain why it looks like I made a mistake on the printing. But we're going to just put this nice colorful sheet down for a second. You'll then find two white packets that look almost identical. The one that we're going to go over first has go. Right there. Give everyone a quick second to find that. All right. So the first part just has your table of contents. Pages one and two goes into the Massachusetts Office on Disability and um, how to contact us. If, again, you ever need additional resources, if you have additional questions, if you want to know what services exist, but also if you're trying to make sure that there are trainings for people in your community, this is the office that you can reach out to. And now I want everyone to go to page three, where it says Disability Indicator Form. So as I um, said at the beginning, one of the big things they found in Hurricane Katrina was how do you actually evacuate people from their homes to a shelter if they, for example, need mobility assistance? Imagining we were all in charge of that situation. Eventually somebody, maybe 30 seconds, would raise their hand and say, well, even if we had like all the vehicles ready to go, even if we had all of the ambulance drivers, firefighters who could then go to these destinations, how would we actually know who would need assistance in case of an emergency? So this is when um, a program called the Disability Indicator Program kind of came into effect. So on pages three and four, it gives you a loose definition. And everything that I'm going to go over is going to be, one, I'll voice it to you. But if you ever get you know, kind of tired of looking at me or the sound of my voice, everything that I'm going to cover will be in this packet. So looking on page five. So imagining you or someone you know will say has like a first aid situation. If they've filled out this form and they've contacted their local emergency professionals, like firefighters, the police department, you gave them this form. If you called 911, they answer the phone, hello, 911, what is your emergency? If, let's say if you're somebody who's deaf or hard of hearing, that caption will now appear on the operator. So the operator will then be able to communicate to the first responders, oh, this person has a disability, this person's deaf. You can't just knock on the door, you now need to do this. But there was no way that your first responders would have known that unless you voluntarily disclosed the information. We've kind of accepted that at like very high levels of the government, they have a lot of information about us. Google, Facebook, everyone who has a computer, they have a lot of information about us. But the truth is your local first responders, firefighters, ambulance drivers in your community, they really don't have access to all this information unless we voluntarily disclose it. So I highly encourage you, if you know someone who actually could benefit from this, who might have a disability or an additional need, to fill out this form and then bring it to your local police station. But there are still probably some people in this room who are thinking, I'm not telling the government anything about me, that's my privacy. I will not in the next 40 minutes be able to convince you otherwise. So what I will say to you is that you need to then have at least have an alternative plan in place. So fortunately, you have a very lovely council on aging here. If you ever think, oh, if there's ever an emergency, I just want someone to know I'm going to need help, you could then maybe contact this Council of Aging and say, could you just keep me on a list in case there's ever a situation? Or you need to rely on your own family and friends, that network, to say, hey, if anything crazy goes on, can you just make sure that you call the uh, police station that I'm going to need assistance getting where I am to a shelter? And ideally, you'd do all of those simultaneously. You'd have your friends and your family, you'd have maybe a nice council on aging here, and then you'd also have your local emergency responders to have this information. The goal is to try to create safety nets so that when something crazy actually does happen, fortunately, one of those safety nets you'll be caught up in. So in terms of communication, this is about how we can tell things from our government. If there was ever an emergency, has any, um, everyone here ever heard like what an Amber Alert sounds like on your phones? Where it goes, ah, 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 that very annoying noise. So that's an example of something called reverse 911. In 911, we need help, 
we call our government. Reverse 911 is the opposite. They have a system in place to communicate out to us. And that might look like a call on your cell phone, on your landline. Some cities and towns are having text messages, emails. You'll have an announcement on the radio, and you'll have an announcement on your television. But apart from all those, there's also a lot of free services that you can access right now to kind of stay in the loop in terms of emergencies. So if you go to the next page, we need page seven. No, I got it right. um, I'm not sure if you have Wi-Fi here. If you do, after this training, download this right away. If not, would you get to your um, home or residence? But it's called the Massachusetts Alert app. So if you go, it doesn't matter if you have an iPhone, Android, whatever. You go into uh, where you download your applications, and I'm more than happy to stick around and help everyone find this. And you download the Massachusetts Alert app. What it does is it uses the GPS on your phone to basically figure out if you're safe or not. So I'm right now in North Fork. Am I pronouncing that correctly? There we go. Fantastic. Sometimes I get lost because I do these trainings all over the states. So I want to make sure I'm in the right city. And let's say there's a chemical spill right next door. My phone now knows, oh, I'm in the radius that is affected. So then all of a sudden I'll get an alert that says, in your area, this is the situation. You need to stay where you are. Do not go outside. But now imagining I'm doing a training out in Worcester, and the same thing happens. There's a chemical spill here in uh, North Fork. My phone knows that I'm safe, so it's not going to start bombarding me with messages for everything that goes on throughout Massachusetts. So but with this, though, it'll stick with you to be able to let you know if you're in that disaster area. So I highly encourage everyone here to download that. There's also a service called Code Red. If you go through the same applications, you type in Code Red and download that, you'll be able to see if the city of Norfolk has this service available. And what it does is it just tells you anything in Norfolk. So that way, if you're on vacation, we'll say you're down in Florida, and something happens in this city, you would then get that alert so you can stay in the loop. And that's called Code Red. So with those two, though, communications, you'll be able to access all these services that go on. And this is staffed by NEMA, the Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency. So they'll be there to communicate to us if there's ever um, a situation that we need to be made aware of. On the page right before it, if called Show Me for Emergencies. This is another cool thing that came out of Hurricane Katrina. Yes, please. Is there, since we travel a lot, is there one for the country? <laughs> so there is not one massive alert for the country. There is an agency that handles that. That's FEMA. Yeah, I know. Um, but they themselves don't have a national broadcasting, mostly because if they did, there are so many instances occurring simultaneously. No, but I'm talking about putting it on your, G on your GPS. So as you travel, you're in Nevada. There's an emergency in Nevada. You just oh, okay. So, so now you're really thinking. Unfortunately, that doesn't exist yet. But that, it would be fantastic if it did. Um, so, you can get the weather that way. I know. <laughs> so how all emergencies work, and actually, so this uh, training is like a little bit of a lecture. I unfortunately just have to talk for a while, but if you have any questions okay, or if you know something or you think it might be relevant to the group, just shoot your hand up. I, I worked in public education for 10 years, so I can keep us all on pace and make sure we all get out of here on time as well. See, that's a great example of what the alert would sound like. <laughs> um, that's so, an emergency. There you go. So all disasters start at the local level. So if there's, like, we'll say, ever a house fire, Doctors. that's going to affect you, you'd call 911, first responders would go there. If that fire continues to spread, it would then use the local fire um, resources from your neighboring towns. <laughs> if that fire continues to spread, then MEMA becomes activated, Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency. That fire spreads even further, it then gets to national level. So my way of saying that is that there is the, the systems that are built start at the local level and then go up, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. We might get to a point where we have, again, enough technology, and to be honest, probably wouldn't be that expensive, just to loop all these systems together so that no matter where you are in the country, it would use your GPS to let you know. I'll put that in the idea box in my next NEMA meeting. But slowly we're working our way there. So as I was saying on the page before, it's show me for emergencies. So during Hurricane Katrina, we had um, all these different people from across the city in one shelter together. And what they quickly found was that no one could communicate. Maybe because there was language barriers, maybe because some people had a disability and just had trouble communicating cognitively. So what they developed was this app, which you can also download for free. And what it is is it's just a series of pictures. So if you ever needed to communicate to people, let's say your next door neighbor, you could then quickly bring up in their language of preference, emergency, evacuate, get your ID ready. 
And this is just a nice little tool. So if you're somebody who's like very active in your community, you would be like the person who is the one who calls everyone, hey, did you hear about this? Did you hear about this? This is a cool app that might be able to help you if there's ever a natural disaster. So every city and town has two things. You have a local emergency manager and you have a local emergency plan. I hesitate to say this, but for $100, does anyone know who your local emergency manager is? Yes. Ah, see, that's why I didn't do it. There's, there's always at least one or two people. So, but, and that's, that's normal, meaning that this is not an elected position, and depending on the size of your community, it might just be your fire chief. Would you know the, the, uh, the name of the individual? Yes. Yeah. No. <laughs> and um, is, the fire chief. is he the fire chief? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Um, do you have an um, isolated position just for the local emergency management? I'm um, part of the uh, volunteer MRC, Medical Reserve Corps. Oh, fantastic. Thank you for being here. So, um, and this person has that plan in place. And now for the second question, who here has ever seen your local emergency plan? Okay. So, and the reason for that is it's not publicly available. And that kind of falls into two camps. One was after 9-11, everyone got kind of nervous sharing really any security measures, not telling people, oh, here's where a large concentration of people will be at this moment. But the second reason, and the reason I spent a lot of time on the communication part, is we really don't know what the emergency is going to look like. Meaning, on this local emergency plan, I believe you'll have like a residence like this as a designated shelter. But if right now I told you, oh, this is your shelter, if you ever get an alert, come here. But it might be a situation where a hurricane is approaching right to this location. So now this will not be your shelter. So rather than us kind of providing that plan for you, me telling you right now, head here, it's much more important to kind of be versatile and to use all these different communication resources so that you can get that um, information at a moment's notice to stay on the same page. I'm continuing with that. The most important thing I'm going to say today, and I'm going to try to say it three times if I do this correctly, all the way on page 14, it's called 211. Has anyone ever heard of 211 before? Okay, fantastic. So we all know 911. That's when we need help from ambulance, our police, firefighters. 211 is when we need information during an emergency. So, for example, in 2013, I was living in Boston with the uh, Boston Marathon bombings. That happened on that Monday. Somewhere around that Thursday night into the Friday morning, they were chasing the two terrorists across the city. So in Boston, they issued a shelter in place, which means do not go outside, stay where you are. After, though, maybe about four or five hours, I had no idea if the shelter in a place was still in effect. So it, I didn't feel like calling 911 because I, I figured they're kind of busy right now. I'll just do my own thing. But if I knew about it, this is the number I would have called. I would have called 211, and it's staffed by MEMA. And then somebody there would have been able to say, oh, actually, the shelter in place is still in effect. Don't go outside yet. Turn to this station for more up-to-date information. So if there's ever an emergency, like if you're getting, uh, if you see something maybe even on the news and you're thinking to yourself, wait, did they just say I have to evacuate? What was that? This is the phone number that you would call to try to give you that information, especially during the emergency itself to have up-to-date information. So 211, that's probably the most important thing that I'm going to say here today. Um, and that was kind of a lot just on communication. As I take a quick sip of my coffee, does anyone have any questions where it comes to communicating during an emergency or anything that I've said at, um, from the beginning? Located. All right, fantastic. Very sharp audience. <laughs> so the second thing I'm going to go into is shelters. So at the, and this is also something that came out of uh, Hurricane Katrina. So what they ended up issuing, they created five or six different types of shelters all across the city. And they were telling people, all right, if you're a general population, I want you to head here. If you're a senior citizen, go over there. If you're someone with a disability, head here. If you have this need, go over there. This was first causing a lot of confusion, but also it was kind of splitting families apart, which is the last thing that we want to do if there's ever an emergency. So in Massachusetts, in general population shelters, we want as many people as possible to go there. There might be a unique medical shelter, depending on the need, but when in doubt, everyone will be heading to the, um, the general shelter. And what this means is that at the shelter, they'll have services available. So for example, if you use a wheelchair and you need a special car that's at a certain level, they can make those adjustments. If you have life-saving medical equipment, like an oxygen tank, if you use something while you sleep, you can have like additional room at a certain location to make sure that you have that need. 
Also, they'll make sure they have as many generators as possible because, as we all know, the first thing that happens in an emergency is the power goes out. And they'll try to have refrigeration because we know that a lot of modern medicine needs to be refrigerated at certain temperatures. So all of those accommodations will be there for you at the shelter itself. And now we get into everyone's favorite uh, topic, pets. Who here has a pet? Okay, generally, normally about one third of the room. So also during Hurricane Katrina, people were told, you cannot bring your pets. Leave your pet, head to the shelter. And this put a lot of families in a tough situation, because for a lot of us, our pets are part of our family. So now people had to think, like, I can't just leave the dogs here. The kids are going to be screaming. Let's just stay where we are and hope for the best. And that unfortunately resulted in unnecessary death. And so it gets a little tricky. So at a state shelter, your state Massachusetts-run shelters, you can bring your pets. Try to bring a crate or a kettle. Try to make sure you have all their medication, their certifications, and their tags. And they'll make those accommodations for you. And now this is generally the part of the training where somebody might get angry. Because they might be thinking, I have a pet allergy. You can't have pets there. And this is not me making a moral judgment. This is me just um, telling you what would happen during the emergency, and that is that people are allowed to bring their pets. So if you can think of it, try to have um, you know, your allergy medication on you, and they'll try to make those accommodations to make sure that the people at the shelter are safe, while also making sure that it's not a barrier to entry. Because what we're trying to do is get as many people as possible to get to the shelter and not be restricted. I said this gets tricky because a Red Cross shelter does not allow animals, meaning pets. And now you might be thinking, well, how am I supposed to know during an emergency whether it's a Red Cross shelter or a state shelter? And that's why I'm going to say for the second time, call 211, and they'll be able to tell you where that shelter is and what type of shelter, um, what organization is running. Hopefully one day they'll all get on the same page, so we don't have to have that distinction. But for right now, Red Cross shelters, no pets. State shelters, you can bring your pets. Except for service animals. All shelters of every type, you can bring your service animals. And there's a lot of confusion on service animals, because every now and then we'll see it on like the nightly news. So just for everyone's edification, for shelter animals, there is no special vest that like they had to have had. There is no special course or certificate that that pet needs to have gone through. If I'm a volunteer at a shelter and someone brings me their pet, they say this is a, shelter, uh, this is a service animal, I can only ask them two things. Is this a service animal? And what services this animal provide for you? I can't say prove it. I can't say make it do a trick. So a service animal is kind of what the individual depends it is. But there's also some laws in place. So for example, if like there's an animal, we'll say at a restaurant, it has like the vest that saying it's a service animal, but it's acting hostile or aggressive. There are certain things that like the restaurant can do that is not an infringement on people's rights. And also just for everyone's uh, clarity, there are two big parts of your life that don't have to follow the ADA. One is housing. They have what's called the Fair Housing Act, and they get to kind of live in their own little world where it comes to accommodations. The second is airlines. The planes we all fly, they get to live in their own legal universe where it comes to people with disabilities. That's why they can kind of like creep the seats as narrow as they want for whatever reason. It's because they get to kind of do their own thing. On planes, you can only bring two different types of service animals. One is a dog. Does anyone know what the second one is? Unless somebody shouts it right now, there's no way you're going to guess it. A horse. There it is. You're allowed to bring a miniature horse on an airplane. Oh um, I looked into it. So the reason for it was before there were power wheelchairs, before that technology really existed, they thought of, well, if we bred horses to a certain size, people in wheelchairs would be able to use them for mobility. And for whatever reason, it's all still on the dockets today. So if you ever see a horse on a plane, you could be the person that explains to everyone what's going on. <laughs> And so that was in terms of shelters. The third part that I'd like to quickly go over before we talk about your individual preparedness is what I just call aftermath. So just because the incident or the storm has come and gone, that doesn't mean that all of your needs have met. Um, did everyone hear about the gas leaks in the Merrimack Valley? So there, was, uh, there were people there who were not allowed to go back to their homes for three to four months. And so even though things kind of left the headlines because of the busy news cycle that we all live in, that doesn't mean that all the people there had everything they need. So if you ever go through a man-made or natural disaster, never stop advocating in terms of your needs, but you might still need access for medication, you might need access for housing, for food. 
trauma. All these events are heavily traumatic. I ended up teaching in New Orleans around 2009, so this was about four years after the storm. Some of my students were in the shelter. The, their um, state shelter was at the Superdome where the Saints play, mm -hmm. so they stayed there during the storm, but they were still experiencing the effects of that traumatic experience for years on up. So make sure you're also advocating for mental health professionals, especially to go into your schools. Fortunately, we all know who your state rep is, and so this will be really the person who will be kind of your champion to make sure that all of your needs are still being met as ever in a burden. Yes? Um, can I also just point out, and Sean can also attest to this, um, as a lion, after that event is over, the lions who are in your community are also people that will be there to help you, who continue to help you, um, and we are still helping all of the people in Merrimack Valley still feeding them, still getting them equipment, still getting the things that they need. So if something ever happened, you can reach out to your local Lions Club. Norfolk has a huge club. Um, and um, just for, in case there's people in the audience who don't know what that is, would you mind spending 30 seconds on Lions? Uh, sure. Lions is um, actually uh, the largest service organization in the world. Um, it is made up of like-minded individuals within your community who are dedicated to uh, the well-being of the communities in that in, uh, I mean, of the citizens in that community. Uh, we are larger than the Red Cross, and the difference is is that the Red Cross, although national and there in the event of an emergency, they tend to come in and leave. Lions stay. Lions are live there in your community. They're the people who are feeding your hungry and helping the citizens with disabilities and they will be there in the event of any kind of an emergency to be able to help you. So I do encourage you to support the groups and um, get involved if you can. Thank you very much. I don't think, uh, I'm, I'm sure. A little PSA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Debbie is the Lion District Governor for this entire region. Thank well. you so much for being here. And Sean is actually an amazing member of the Northern <laughs> Lions Club. And so that, those were really the three big things that I wanted to make sure that we talked about today. Communication, sheltering, and then advocating for aftermath. Also in this packet, there's still some great state resources that I just want to quickly go over. So on the page uh, right after 211, on page 15, it's called Mass Options. So we're lucky in Massachusetts, we have a lot of resources, but the hardest part is communicating to people where those resources are. So if you're ever looking for day services, personal care, health and therapeutic, equipment, mental health, in-home supports, anything like that, Spend 10, 20 minutes, go on this website for Mass Options, call this phone number, and you'd be amazed how many discounted services exist. I, I'm sure most of this goes to Medicare or Medicaid in terms of insurance um, coverage, but there are a lot of great low uh, discount and maybe even free services that exist if you just spend maybe the 20 minutes trying to access it through Mass Options. It's also the same on page 16 with a program called Reequipment. So if you have old medical equipment, we'll say like an old cane or rocker that you don't use anymore, you can call these people up, they'll come by, they'll pick it up from you, they'll make it all nice and uh, clean, they'll restore it, they'll give it to somebody in need. Vice versa, if you need equipment, if you're trying to get access to like a shower chair, a sling lift, a power wheelchair, anything like that, and you don't know where to go, also call um, this number, go on this website, and then, again, you'll be amazed how many of these services exist, if, but unfortunately it takes maybe about 20 minutes navigating an odd website to actually mm -hmm. figure it out. So that was mass, mass options of re-equipment. Everything else on this packet, pages 9 through 13, it's, it, it goes over what I'm about to discuss in terms of individual preparedness, but it also has some great resources in terms of additional equipment that you might need if there's ever an emergency. So, Unless there are any more questions on anything pertaining to the go pack that I just gave you. We can put that uh, nice one down. And now we can pick up the other one called Personal Emergency Preparedness Workbook. So uh, did anyone hear about the wildfires out in California? Um, during that incident, somebody tweeted out on their phone, I just got the alert to evacuate, I panicked, all I grabbed was my Tom Brady jersey. Okay. Every now and then, that gets a good laugh. And Tom Brady liked it, that's how I found out about it. And then maybe about 30 hours later, that same individual tweeted out, oh, I just was stuck on the highway for 24 hours trying to evacuate, I really wish I was better prepared. And so this part of it, we're gonna go over two things. One is what information do you need to have written down? And I'm gonna emphasize again, written down. You can have the sharpest memory in the world, 
but if all of a sudden your phone starts going off to evacuate, you will not be able to recall it in the same way. There's no way you'll be able to say, oh yeah, the second uh, phone number for my emergency contact, is by the way, that's just not how our brains function. Everyone will get a hit of adrenaline and you're just gonna kinda go into panic mode. So if you have that information written down though, you'll be ready to go. This packet will probably take you roughly <coughs> 10 minutes to complete, but the 10 minutes that you put into this will pay huge dividends if you ever actually do need to evacuate. And again, thinking again the people in Merrimack Valley, what information do I need to have written down if I can't get back to my home for three months at a time? So I'm not going to go through it line by line, but on the first page, it's just kind of your uh, biographical information, you know, who you are, your address, pages um, two, three, and four are your in case of emergency. Excuse me. We recommend that you have three emergency contacts, two from your community, your city, and then one that's really far away. And the reason for that is if <coughs> you three were each other's emergency contacts, but right now something happens in Norfolk and all, now all your phones start going off, you'll be very hard to kind of help one another because you're going to be too focused on getting your own things ready. So what we tell people is pick one person who lives in a different city, far away, so that if there's ever an emergency here, you can quickly call them and say, hey, turn on the news, this is what's going on, I'm going to give everyone your phone number, can you stay up to date, go online, watch the news, let me know what's going on. So that way that person who's safe will be able to help you out from that stable position. You mean within Massachusetts, though? Um, it can I mean, still I wouldn't be my, my niece in Omaha. <laughs> I mean, honestly... Uh, the, the distance part for that third contact, as long as that person's safe, doesn't matter where they are, they'll still be able to kind of be a hub for you in terms of information and getting the, those resources to you. So it might be the, your family friend from Omaha. Um, also, for um, in case of emergencies, how many people here have a smartphone? Okay, and just curious, how many people here have the old school flip phones? Okay, so in emergency, we'll say survival, People with smartphones, you have an advantage at this stage because you can download all those cool apps I was talking about. There's also something called in case of emergency. So right now, if like this ceiling tile fell, hit me on the head, and um, I had to go to the hospital, no one in this room knows my passcode to get into my phone. But all smartphones now, or at least most, they have a, a um, cool little function where if you bring up someone's phone and you hit emergency, it'll then bring up their emergency contact number. So that if that would happen to me right now, hopefully one of you will remember I just said that. Grab my phone, you hit emergency, it would go, I believe, to my father, and then you can say, oh, your son was just here giving a training, he's now headed to so-and-so hospital. Unfortunately, because there's so many different types of like phone <laughs> software, it's in a different location on all of your phones. It takes me like five minutes to figure out on each individual cell phone how to do this, but I'm happy to stick around and do it. But if you go to your settings, it'll either be under ICE, in case of emergency, It'll either be labeled as emergency or it'll be labeled as SOS. So spend five minutes playing on your smartphone. Hopefully you'll be able to find that. It's a cool service to have. So uh, going back to the packet, we have our emergency contact information. The uh, next thing is medication. Again, right now I'm relatively calm. However, I can't pronounce most of the medication I take. I certainly don't have memorized all the milligrams and everything. So again, thinking of the Merrimack Valley, if you couldn't get access to all of that, you need to have it written down somewhere. So for some of us who take a lot of medication, that might sound like a little bit of a pain, but the next time you go to your pharmacist or your doctor, you can just say, can you print out my um, prescription list? They'll print it out for you, you can just paste it right there. A lot of us go to Walgreens or CVS for our medication, and like the new bottles, they kind of have those little stickies now. So the next time you finish your bottle, you can just take the sticky, rip it off, and then post it right there. It might save you some time. But having your medication listed will certainly be a huge asset. Also on that same line, your medical conditions, what people at your shelter need to know, that again, might be hard for you to recall in terms of like your treatment regimen, but having it written down. Your, whatever your allergies are. Also your equipment. This is kind of an important one. It's something we don't think about until we have to go through it. So if, let's say you have um, a really bad flood in this area, and then you have to leave for a few days, you come back, and maybe some like, medical equipment, maybe a wheelchair, a rocker, or oxygen tank, something that's damaged during that, it's going to be a huge pain for you to like go with Medicare or Medicaid to stay on the phone and try to communicate, like, oh, well, I got this 15 years ago at this site. I don't know the model number because all that got destroyed in the flood. 
But having that stuff written down ahead of time, it'll kind of speed through that process so you'll be able to get hopefully new equipment sooner rather than later. Also, in terms of information you should know, your healthcare information, and then if you want to um, write down some good, we'll say, emergency contacts in this area. So it, tell, it leaves you a space in terms of like your evacuation route, your shelter, things like that. But I'm going to kind of uh, reiterate that the more important thing is being able to communicate in the moment. Because even though right now I might be able to tell you, well, in, you're in Norfolk, so like you would go head down this highway. Again, I really don't know what the emergency is going to be. That could be exactly where the disaster zone is, so I don't want you to head there. So call 211, use the uh, alert apps, make sure that you're um, sticking to your local radio station, um, TV program to be able to get up-to-date information. So I trust everyone here, and I'm sure you're all going to go home. Yes, please. Can I make a recommendation? Please. That you actually take a picture of every page after you fill it out. That's a good idea. Keep it in your phone because in the event of an emergency, you're going to grab your keys and your phone, kids and dog, and leave, and you're not going to get this. Oh, so you just stole my punch one. Okay. <laughs> As I was about to say. Sorry. You're right back. Oh, and I'm about to go into that too. Oh, don't worry. Oh, all, all, all these great ideas are going to come up in about four and a half minutes. <laughs> so, as I'm sure, you're all going to go home and fill this up. As we just addressed, in all likelihood, you're going to take this and you're going to put it in a desk drawer or you're going to like throw it on a kitchen counter or somewhere. And you will be the only person who knows where that is. But if there's ever an emergency, you're probably going to panic and forget it's there. So all the information that we kind of just put into this, I am going to have you put it in three different locations. The first is this big mother packet that has all the stuff, all mice and me written down. The second, and I'm sure some people here are familiar with it, has anyone ever heard of the file of life? No. Okay. So if not, please speak to the people here at the Council of Aging. They might be able to help you out. Your local first responders, local police station, firefighters. This is free for you, meaning the citizen. It probably costs your city three and a half cents to make one of these. It probably saves about 10,000 lives a year. And all it is is a lot of the information we just discussed kind of written down in this small little packet, especially about the, your medication, your allergies. It has a little magnet on the back. It goes right on your um, refrigerator door. So just because I'm using the same example, imagining I'm in my kitchen, and all of a sudden something falls down, knocks me out, I'm unconscious, somebody finds me, calls 911. The firefighters, they come in. There's no way they're going to be able to locate this big packet. Because again, I have it in some desk drawer somewhere. But all first responders are trained to look for this. This will be kind of right on your refrigerator. And then they can just see it like, oh, okay, great. Now they know that I'm allergic to so-and-so. They know what medication I'm on. So there won't be any mistakes in terms of the uh, conditions and treatment that I get. So this is the second location to put it all in. The third location, and now we can finally get to the nice shiny blue packet. Pamphlet there. Um, and this will not help you during an emergency, but just for everyone's knowledge. Oh, and uh, yeah, yeah. so we have some of these with the new sheriff's name, the new sheriff's in town, in case you haven't heard. Um, and the new sheriff is actually coming here on July 23rd, another opportunity to get free food and good information. So I'm sure they'll be bringing a lot more of these. I'm not sure if you said Evan, there's two sizes. This is the one that you put on the mic. This might be a good time to do this yourself. <laughs> like, I will speak to these. These are actually very helpful. We use these all the time. Um, when we do um, go to an unresponsive patient and they can't talk or we don't know them, we do go to the refrigerator and we utilize these all the time. So I do highly suggest, um, especially if you have any medical issues or anything, just to have the contact information is nice for a daughter or a sister-in-law or a brother-in-law or a husband or something, just so we can get a hold of them too to let them know that you're at the hospital. So if they have, you know, we'll call them, it's like, you know, we just found so-and-so unresponsive. What do we need to know? So there's the two sizes. As Mike said, this is the one that goes in your refrigerator. If it's magnetized, now they have the nose stick, so you might have to find another spot. Yeah. Um, and then this is the one that you can carry in your wallet or your purse. And so we do have a few, but there'll be more on July 23rd. Mark your calendars. There we go. Fantastic. So. As I kind of pointed out in the beginning, I get a kick because whenever I pass this pamphlet out, people start to spin it and they think I made a mistake. I gave you all like, uh, the wrong copies. This will not help you during an emergency. But if you ever want to see how it's supposed to be, 
So my supervisor figured out it's a lot cheaper to print it like this and then tell people, fold it yourselves, than if I were to order 10,000 of these already folded. Again, this won't help you, but just kind of as like a cool little origami exercise. If you have it so the red bag is facing you, and that is the part that's properly correct, and then you take it and you kind of fold it back, make a nice little crease, and then you take that and then you kind of just cut it in half. Now it looks like it makes sense. And this is normally the part of the training where I'll lose four or five of you because you're going to spend 10 minutes on this. Again, I promise I can help you. I will fold all of these for you. You don't need to spend that much time on it right now. But again, this is a cool little thing to say. So this is the third location that I tell people to put your information in. And if you look right in the middle, it goes through a smaller version of that big mother package that I call. And this is the part that, again, I want you to take it, fold it any way you want, put it in a little Ziploc baggie so it's waterproof, and then just place it right in this red bag. So that way, you'll have all of your information with all of your equipment ready to go. So if you ever do have to get that emergency alert two and a half years from now, you can just take this nice little red bag and go, and you'll have that information that you need. Also on this, it goes into a little bit of the MOD again, how to contact us and visit the website. You'll be able to get the um, phone number for client services and all of those needs. It has in the middle your information. On the very back, it has most of the things that I've either talked about or about to talk about in terms of like a shelter in place, an evacuation, what um, equipment do you need, and we'll both get into that in a moment. There's another part of this that you can probably see that looks a little out of place, and it says active shooter slash terrorism. So as I said before, this um, program is funded through the Department of Homeland Security. And whenever there's a new Homeland Security director, right now we have an active director, we don't have like an appointed director confirmed. That new person gets to say, all right, whoever takes our money, I want you to talk about this. This was when active shooter, this is still on the books, was something that they want everyone to be trained on. And it does kind of follow the uh, natural steps in terms of a um, disaster relief. And I'm sure people saw in the news, I believe there was another shooting in Virginia, so this is just good information to kind of have everyone have in the back of your mind. But you would follow similar steps to what we discussed. The first thing you do is, if it's safe to do so, evacuate from the area. If right now we heard gunshots, it's actually very difficult to tell where they are coming from and how close that is. So if, unless you know for sure that you are in a safe location that you can evacuate, the second thing is to shelter in place. Oh, um, shelter in place, meaning stay exactly where you are, you would shut off the lights, you would try to barricade the doors in some, in some way, turn your phones to quiet or mute, stay nice and quiet. The third, that is when you would fight in a situation, and the reason they discuss this during training is because sometimes like, I might they would talk in front of a group of college kids, and their instinct is, oh, if I hear shooting, I'm going to run towards the shooter. As a member of the state government, I do not want you to do that. I want you to be safe. If we told people to head towards gunfire, that would just increase the uh, likelihood of people getting hurt. So fighting is always the last resort. And then the fourth thing is to just make sure that you're listening to the first responders when they get there, following all the steps they tell you to do, making sure you're not making any erratic movements, your hands are visible, those sorts of things. I'm more than happy to... Um, talk more about this after the training if people have further questions that they would like me to discuss it. And now we can finally kind of get to the main event, which is the actual equipment that you would need in case of an emergency. So there's something called the rule of four in like survival school. Every four minutes you have to breathe. Every four hours you need shelter, either like being indoors or clothing, protection from the environment. Every four days you need water, every four weeks you need food. That's not exactly right. Um, depending on your body type and your environment, you could probably make it six or seven days without water. Some of us can only maybe make it three weeks without food, some can make it five weeks. It varies depending on, again, who you are in your environment. What we focus on is to have at least uh, enough material for either a 24-hour evacuation or a three-day period. Um, all hospitals have to be able to self-sustain for three days meaning like not getting any additional resources, you need to have everything on site for a three day period. And that's also what I kind of recommend for people who have to shelter in place. Like imagining a massive blizzard where you just can't physically go outside for two to three days at a time. 
the largest number one thing that is not in this bag that you would need in this situation is food. The reason for that is, I guess, at an earlier model of this bag, they used to have like a bunch of cans and all that, but then after this training, people would grab the bag, and it was so heavy that they just couldn't lift it. So after this training, like maybe go tomorrow, um, buy some nice canned goods, have them at your house, because they just have a long uh, life expectancy, get some power bars, candy, whatever you would want to self-sustain, throw them in this bag. Again, trying to imagine you were that individual on a highway in California for 24 hours, you're not looking for like all of your fruits, vegetables, like your natural diet, but just enough food in your stomach so that you'll be able to focus to get from where you are to where you need to go. So everyone go buy food. Um, the heaviest item in here, but it's the one that you're gonna wanna have if you ever have to go 24 hours without it, is water. It has two large packets, and this is not like quote unquote normal water. It's highly condensed, highly purified, with like the electrolytes and all that good stuff. It says two bags per day per person, which means this would be enough for about like a car ride for about two days with four people in it. Everyone in this room drinks more water than just these two packets. But again, it, it will keep you hydrated, it'll keep you focused to be able to get from where you are to where you, where you need to go. It has also a five year life span. Most of the bottled water that we all drink has an expectancy of about one year. So it's 2019 right now, you'll be good until 2024, and then you can take it, maybe try the water out to see what it would taste like, and then throw it away, restock your water. It has a series of tissues, because again, this is a highly traumatic event, but also imagining you're on that highway for 24 hours, if you have to pull over and use the restroom, you'll be covered. Mm -hmm. It has a first aid kit with bandages, um, reusable gauze, alcohol cleaning pads, all that stuff. If two hours from now you cut your hand, the first thing you're going to think of is, oh sweet, I have band-aids now. You are welcome to use this in any of your needs, but then just always remember, oh, I have to restock and put it nice in the red bag. It also has two feminine hygiene pads, so they have their initial use, but also if you kind of look at this first aid kit, the bandages are really small. Mm -hmm. If you have cut yourself, this is actually the largest uh, bandage that you now have. And um, if there's ever a shelter in place where we tell like a city or community, stay where you are, the number one injury is people slicing their hands open when they're trying to open those cans for the first time. So we have a little can opener for you that has a uh, safeguard so your hand will be nice and uh, safe. You'll be able to open those cans that you bought three years ago finally. We also have uh, two ponchos, so they're nice and bright to be able to get first responders' attention. Um, this summer, let's say if you're going to go out to I don't know, a concert, and you're like, oh, I wish I had a poncho. Again, this is going to be the first poncho that you think of. I guarantee you that there is no one in this room, including myself, that could take this out of the bag and then refold it and put it back in the bag. So these are kind of a single-use item. You are free to use this, but then I always remember, oh, I just used that poncho. I need to now go buy another poncho and put it back in the red bag. Also, to keep yourself nice and warm, we have two emergency blankets. Uh, if you watch like one of those long endurance races, a marathon, and you see them get covered with what looks like tin foil, this is what it is. It just kind of traps in all the heat. It can't probably choose the most comfortable fabric, but again, it's just there to keep you nice and warm. It's also highly reflective, so hopefully a first responder would be able to see you if you use this in that sort of situation. Also has two um, packets of hand warmers. Uh, we all live in New England, and I'm sure you've used these. It says 10 hours. They're probably more likely to last you three to four hours. But between the hand warmers, the emergency blankets, and the ponchos, you'll be able to keep yourself nice and warm. Again, trying to get from where you are to where you need to go. It also has a red fanny pack. When I first started this job, I couldn't figure out why this was in there. So people would ask me, can I just bring this to the casino? I'm just like, I guess. But I actually thought of a really good reason. So if you're ever at a shelter for a few days, you're gonna be surrounded by a bunch of people you don't know. You're not gonna to wanna to just sit down at your cot, making sure all your stuff is nice and safe. But if you have this cool poncho with you, you able to keep that with you. Well, I'm sorry, poncho. What do you call these things again? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you can put your money, your identification, all that stuff on you, keep it safe. Then you'll be able to go for a walk and you'll have a little bit more mental ease. 
also being at a shelter, we have a uh, large amount of like hygiene products. So this is to try to cut down on infection, making sure people are nice and clean. This little red bio bag. So if you're ever kind of stuck in a car for a day or two, you can like put your waste in this so you won't get sick. Also, probably the uh, biggest health benefit, I mean, besides like the actual uh, cleanliness, is everyone this morning when you woke up, you went through your morning routine, and that actually has a huge amount of like your physiological health. If you don't go through your morning routine for whatever reason, your body is just kind of messed up for the entire day. So this is already a heavily traumatic event. So if you compound that uh, traumatic event with not going through your, mo your morning routine, your bodies just start to shut down and don't work as properly as we want them to. So we tell people, even at a shelter, try to go through your morning routine just to set uh, reset your own physiological health. If you ever are stuck on the side of the road, we have some cool stuff. So this is a little uh, glow-up nightstick, just like a piece of plastic, crack it, and then it's visible probably up to about a half mile. We have a little whistle, we try to make some noise. A cool little insider trick is this has like a little lanyard, like a little um, circle right there. If you take uh, this lanyard, the, uh, the rope of the whistle, you tie it through that and you spin it, it makes it visible for quite a large range. So again, if you ever stuck like your car breaks down during one of these emergencies, you're trying to get someone's uh, help, you'll be able to signal them. And the best value that we have is this four-in-one hand crank flashlight radio. So we used to have the flashlight radios that use like those big uh, Duracell batteries. Mm -hmm. But what we found was that like three years from now, if you ever needed this, now the batteries don't work. So this does not run on batteries. It uses a little hand crank. One minute of doing this gives you 10 minutes of power. So it has got a flashlight, it has a noise maker, it has a radio, so you can try to get information. The coolest thing that it has is a cell phone charger. So you can kind of plug your cell phone into this and crank it. And now, I said before that if you have a smartphone, you have an advantage. You, you can download all the cool little gizmos to this. Unfortunately, though, it takes a lot of power to actually generate modern cell phones. I've tried it. I've been able to do it, plugging it in and just going at it for a while. I can get enough of a charge. However, if you were someone who held on to the old school flip phones, those don't use that much power. So you can just plug one of those into this, crank it just like you normally would, and you will be the person who will actually be able to communicate to the outside world. So now you have the advantage. So if anyone ever made fun of you, this is when you get that. Effect for but uh, this is an incredible resource. So um, between everything here, Again, you need to make sure you go buy food because you're going to need something to sustain yourself for one to three day period. Also, you need to make sure you have your medication. And this is kind of, it's very easy for me to say, have backup medication. But as we all know who actually get medication, there's a certain window that like our doctors will refill a prescription up to like 30 days. You can't necessarily just say, give me backup medication. So kind of like living with that reality of how we all uh, live our day-to-day -day lives, just create a system, making, make sure that you have medication in a certain spot that you always go to. Try to leave a reminder of make, like a little checklist. Most of the information that I gave you here tells you, make sure you have this, make sure you have that. Just like a little list so you can able to look at, all right, do I have my identification? And that's the next part. Make copies of like your licenses, social security cards, birth certificates. Again, imagining you go through what happened in Merrimack Valley, where you just, you're just you not allowed to physically go into your house for four months. Like, What is just some material that you might need to have on hand to be able to prove or go through whatever it is you need to? So medication, your personal identification, all of this. Including that, there is it's not like an airline where it's like a one bag minimum. For shelters, you can bring additional things, so you don't need to limit yourself just to this red bag. So I would say have this red bag just to have all, um, all this great emergency supplies. Make sure you have another bag that has like additional clothing, personal effects, things that you would need for a few day period, and you are more than welcome to bring both to the shelters. Also your pets, I'll just I'll repeat again, make sure you have their certification, their IDs, their tags, medication things that you won't, wouldn't necessarily think of until you're now stuck with your animal for a two to three day period. And besides this, that basically concludes the training. I have two big asks of you before I start passing out uh, the go bags for everyone. The first is to actually fill out this information. If you don't have a file of life, go get the file of life. Um, something in just disaster management is and how we kind of process as humans is we don't actually think any of this stuff can happen to us. Like we just think it's like a 
visceral experience when watching on the nightly news. We all know that in Massachusetts, we have like, one of the oldest infrastructures in the entire nation, so like the, uh, the gas leaks that have in Merrimack Valley. So this is something which is going to occur with more frequency. We all know that we're getting more and more storms, natural disasters. We had um, tornadoes in Western Mass. We're going to have constant flooding on our shores. So these instances will be racketing up. So make sure you actually have your information written down. You have a little bit of a plan in terms of what would you need if you ever get that alert. The second ask I have of you is I have a very unique job where really I kind of just travel and put on trainings like this. What that means is that the Department of Homeland Security really has no way of knowing if I'm actually doing this. For all they know, I'm just like selling these bags and just not talking to people. So if you could, I'm going to pass out these quick little evaluation forms. You do not need to put your name on it. You do not need to put anything at the top. You can just check these boxes. If you thought I did a good job, you can check agree. If you thought I was okay, you can check partly agree. If you thought I was horrible, you can check disagree. I have to give you the bad regardless, so like, be truthful. If you have additional comments, anything like that, you can put them at the bottom. I'll pass around some pens. Try not to steal the pens, but I know people steal pens, that's okay. Uh, besides that, I'll answer questions as I pass all this stuff out, but you've been a fantastic audience, and thank you very much. Thank you.